Holmes and Flynn Lyle. But we sort of stuck with that. And then they took all those pictures and they said, that, okay, here's Robert Conkman, who was hugely important. We don't have a single one by him, so boom, Robert Conkman equals Master of Flamel. And there's still a lot of argument. In fact, last time I was showing you quite a few, again, I, I mean, I can't even pretend to be vaguely an expert in this period, because this is the sort of picky youn stuff that people who have nothing better to do and are looking for PhD topics get into this. But I mean, could the same artist have done that, have done that, have done that, and have done that. I mean, to me, they look different enough that at least it raises questions. If you say that the same artist couldn't have done it, then you're sort of limiting that one artist, aren't you, though, that they've got to be always the same. But that was kind of what they were. I mean, you didn't go out on a limb and express your innermost soul the way that people do now. You would, you were doing a job, you were told what to do, basically. You didn't really have that much of an option. So, again, we'll talk about this a bit more. Part of the conservatism of the art was the system of uh, apprenticeship. Because there were no art schools. You, served, you, you could be 10, 12 years old. You, went, you studied with an artist, you swept the floor, you ground the pigments, you worked your way up gradually, you did little bits and pieces uh, as you get more proficient in your job. And then, but your job, essentially, as an apprentice, was to paint your master's pictures because he would delegate bits, you know, the still life or a window or a stubble on a chin to maybe one of the uh, apprentices and or then you would work your way up to assistant as opposed to just being a pupil basically. So you're, uh, you, you, you were basically continuing perfectly in imitation of the style of your teacher. So any individuality really isn't an issue and for an artist then to become independent, usually, usually you got out of the system when you were 21, that's the standard date, means other, there, are, there are exceptions. But normally you've served your seven, eight, nine years of hard labor. When you're 21, then you're an independent master. You can take commissions in your own right. You get the money for yourself. It's actually, apprentices were a good source of income. Rembrandt made a fortune out of apprentices in the 1630s. Uh, Rubens, I mean, they had people lining up to be taught by the master. But again, that leads to a, a similarity of style. I mean, there are dozens of artists listed on the guilds in Bruges, say, or Ghent in, in the, the, the 1430s or so. And there's only a very, very few pictures that can really be said to me, that's got to be by him. So that's why I don't want to get bogged down in that all the time because it becomes a little bit esoteric, would be a good word. So this is the, the major thing I want to show you today, which, as I said, I put it up at the end of Monday's class. And, uh, it's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but in the cloisters, I mentioned that, which is the kind of medieval branch up in northern Manhattan. And since not one of you had even been to the Metropolitan Museum, have you ever been there since Monday? Uh -huh. Oh, that's not working. Um, August. Well, what? August. Going in August. If I'm August, in okay. That's, well, that'll do it. That's yeah. all right. But, and I should say, but I don't think we'll see too many in this course, but if you go to New York, and if you like old master's art rather than contemporary modern and everything else, go to the Frick Collection. And if you don't know the Frick Collection, which is on, it's about 20 blocks south of the Metropolitan Museum, it's right on Fifth Avenue, it's an amazing, amazing collection. Uh, put together by probably the biggest villain. In fact, I think he was voted the worst CEO in the history of America. He was bringing guys with machine guns to get his people to behave. Uh, but he amassed this extraordinary collection, and this was one way. It's actually quite similar, as we'll see a couple of examples of people back then. In fact, I think I mentioned it on Monday. People with guilty consciences who would commission beautiful things, either buildings or paintings, what have you, to ease their passage into heaven. And the worse crimes you committed, the more expensive things you had to, to create. And that, I think that's what Mr. Frick did, because he was, I mean, he's got to be rotting downstairs anyway, but he's got an amazing collection, and it's actually in his house, so it's not a gallery, it's rooms and fireplaces and windows, the way art is supposed to be back then anyway. Uh, so do the brick collection, but then do the, the cloisters as well. So this is, uh, combat, if you remember, his dates were about 1375, died in 1444. There's so many artists at this time, we don't know exactly when they were born, usually we know that when they died, because there's better records. Uh, for that sort of thing. Uh, lived most of the time in Tournai. I gave a lot of uh, information about what he did there. Not for you to remember it, but just to give you an idea of what a successful artist did, how he earned, earned his living. Uh, so this was done, again, as I said, you 
you'll see slightly different dates. Mine are the only ones that count, so just make sure you remember that. 14, 25, 30 or so. And it's not big, I think I didn't put that up, sorry. See, look how small it is. So in fact, when it's called an altarpiece, I think that's a little bit presumptuous. Because an altarpiece implies that it's in a big chapel in the church or even the main altar. So it's going to be huge for public display. And this is quite clearly for private devotion. And there's a huge difference because you have an intimacy of scale and subject matter and everything else. This is to be, remember, it's a triptych. So you fold up the wings uh, and you just carry it around. When you go on your travels, um, it's with you all the time, basically. So it's very portable, uh, which is kind of important. Uh, and it's called the Mayroad altarpiece because it belonged to a family called Mayroad for a couple of hundred years. They weren't the original owners, they didn't commission it. but uh, if you remember last week, the Wilton Diptych, same sort of idea, you get your name attached to the thing. Uh, 25 inches high, the side um, wings are about 11, 11 inches wide or so. So it's quite small, it's nice. So that's, that's the way the trouble is, you have to really get up close to it. And I remember, that, well I think it's changed now, because when I was there one time, I kept pressing my nose over, and there was some sort of a ray gun protection thing. As soon as you went anywhere close, it went, <coughs> a really annoying noise came, because it's in a room all by itself. Usually there isn't even a guard in the room. So that was just a little warning to jump back. I think a taser would be good. Just to... <laughs> but that's the trouble. You want to get your face an inch away from it to see all this amazing detail that I'm going to zoom in on for you. So as I say, it is small, it is private. Uh, maybe it's a little bit puffed up in reputation because it's the best thing of its kind from this period in uh, North America, uh, but it's still pretty damn good. And what we see is the central scene is the Annunciation, and we're going to see approximately 352 Annunciations throughout this course. It's actually quite useful to have one theme, one subject, which you can then compare to other ones, like a Madonna and Child, that would be uh, the most common image, I'm sure. So the Annunciation. And again, remember you're all reading the Bible. Did you all read the Bible since Monday? Uh, you did? No. Sure. Um, <laughs> page three. Uh, it's the Annunciation, and again, I'm assuming that a lot of you aren't familiar with Christian uh, historical facts, if that's the right way of putting it. This is the, the angel Gabriel, or the archangel. There were four archangels, and his job, Gabriel, G-A-B-R-I-E-R, was to show up and tell Mary the Virgin Mary, that she's going to be the mother of God. And she's calmly sitting there reading the book. I mean, I think you or I would maybe be a little bit startled. Maybe he hasn't quite said it yet. And he's an angel, so he might be invisible. But the point is, you don't read these things literally. This is all kind of dogma, in a way. And it's, it's all an illustration of faith. Anyway, that's the central theme. And then on the wings, you have the two people who paid for it. And again, there's a huge argument about exactly if these are by the same artist or a little bit later. One of the things is that normally when you fold up a, an older piece, and again, we'll see an example in a bit, there's stuff to look at on the outside. Well, we saw that last week with the Wilton Diptych, remember the beaten out part. On the back of these panels here, there's nothing, which makes people a little bit suspicious. There's another version of the central panel somewhere else that some people think is the real one. And then, see, if, if, again, if you were, see, if you were a successful artist, and you do a, a, a picture and it sells, do another one for God's sake. I mean, you don't have to reinvent yourself every time. So there's a lot of repetition. In the studio, they would probably keep a drawing of the main composition, and then they would just hand it to the pupils, and then they would just repeat that for the next customer. Quite acceptable. So maybe, I mean, to me, this is so well painted, it looks better painted than the other version. So. Uh, this is, but then people think that maybe it changed hands so the wings were added later. Uh, but anyway, whoever it is, we'll, we'll look at them in detail in just a second. That's the, they're called the donors, D-O-N-O-R-S, the people who paid for it. And then on this side, my favorite part of the whole picture is old, Saint, old Joseph. When we saw him last time, 18 and handsome when he gets engaged and married to Mary, 102 within a year or so. So here he is working away in his carpenter's shop. And it's a marvellous illustration, again, of the craftsman on the job. It's quite wonderful. So just to give you a little, a couple of other uh, annunciations. Last week, uh, last time I showed you the um, 
Limburg Brothers. This is actually from another book that they wrote from, from the illustrated with the same fellow. It doesn't really matter what you did. Just to give you an idea, look at this incredibly rich, uh, the bordering, all of the, the royal insignia. I mean, there's a ton of, you could just spend a day looking at all this lovely stuff around here. Looks like somebody's playing the bongos. I don't think that could be it. Uh, and flower. Remember what I said about the, the, the bear and the, the, the swan? There's the bear, Ous, and then Seaton for the swan. There'll be swan somewhere as well. Um, the, the Duke's mistress, her last name is Ursine, so it's a little pun on that. Uh, and quite often, not here, you get actually quite funny stuff in the board. It's almost like the artists are bored by the central bit, so they just sort of go nuts. They're often called grotesqueries. And here they're quite well behaved, making music. But the central theme of the Annunciation, again, just with, with Gabriel uh, showing up, how, how he is represented very often is kind of the, the gentleman proposing marriages. If he sort of falls to one knee, you know, he's going to hand over the ring, will you marry me, that sort of idea. But he, he very often carries lilies, or lilies would be placed next to Mary, because lilies were one of the symbols of purity. Every flower means something, every color means something. There's, there's always that sort of lateral meaning. That's what I was saying. You have to sort of read your dictionary of symbols. Uh, and so here, any count, he's going sort of bless, bless. He's got this, I'm, where he does his shopping, I'm not quite sure. He's got this amazing outfit. Uh, that's rather good. And then she's, again, she's not that, she's a little bit surprised. Uh, there's that dove, that pigeon there. That's actually the dove of the Holy Spirit, which is the third part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. So he's saying, but God himself is actually up here in the sort of, it's like he's at the theatre in the box seat, the best seat in the house. I'm not quite sure who that is, propping him up. Um, that's Moses, uh, who was one of the most popular of all the Old Testament prophets, partly because what he's holding in his hand, you can see that thing, that that's the Ten Commandments, the tablets of the Lord. When he's running away from Egypt, and he goes to the mountain and God brings all these, don't do this, don't do that, all a bit negative. Uh, so there he is, standing there on this wonderful bookcase. Uh, and it looks like a dog's kennel, but that's, you've got all the like, nice books. Now, again, to be picky, you didn't actually have books. I mentioned this on Monday, I think. In the year, well, nothing at this point, uh, you had scrolls only. And that sort of thing, a reference to that up there. The secret, how clever it is, it's a winding up thing. You can, you can raise and lower that, depending if you're sitting or kneeling or standing. You just kind of spin it around and up it goes. But, and, but usually, well, I think, go back and look it up again. I think books in our format were about the third century or the fourth century. They were, they were invented by lawyers in Rome who were... Uh, well, I mean, lawyers, you know, they're always looking at precedents for this, and they got sick of rolling back and forwards in these great scrolls looking for what happened ten years ago. So somebody just had the right idea of cutting the scroll up into bits and sewing it up at one side, and now you can just sort of flip through the pages. And they were codifying the law. So even nowadays, well, not that much, but the shape of the book is called a codex. Uh, from the, the from what the lawyers were up to. So anyway, there's Mary looking rather sort of poe faced. But as I said, this is the international Gothic style, which is just so elegant and sophisticated and tons of stuff just to look at, almost smothering the meaning. Uh, so that's only about ten years before the Mary of the Beast. Down in Italy, about ten years after the Mary of the Beast. If you know your Italian Renaissance art, well, this is a wonderful painting of Fra Angelico, the, the angelic brother. He was actually a monk. A holy man painting holy pictures. And if you're in Florence, which you have to go to the, on the Florence program, it's good. Uh, in a, still in the monastery of San Marco, there are lots and lots and lots of paintings by Fra Angelico because that was his home and he decorated the whole place basically. Uh, but at the top of the stairs, when you go in there, so again in a public space, and this, one, this is fresco. Remember what I said last week about the joy of northern Renaissance art? So much of it is that it's oils being developed exactly at this time by people like Van Eyck and Compact. And that gives it that sort of glow and that uh, kind of depth of color, which has remained bright and strong. Frescoes tend to fade away a little bit. Uh, but it, see, Fran Jell, he's always said to be completely spiritual and otherworldly and everything. It is rather weightless, similar thing, weightless figure.